Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think we'll get started now. My name's Roland Mallinson. Uh, I'm a partner at Taylor Wessing, but I'm also uh, a director on the Council of Marks, uh, and this is a jointly hosted event. Uh, so on behalf of Marks, I'd like to welcome you here uh, and thank also uh, Sir Robin Jacob and UCL and Ibel for uh, hosting us here. Um, I, I do a little intro uh, each time we do this, um, simply just to flag to you the existence of Marks for the, they don't, those don't know it. Uh, European Trademark Owners Association. Uh, one of the things we do uh, actively on behalf of brand owners generally is to intervene in cases uh, and uh, we intervened uh, earlier this year in one um, in relation to the Red Bull uh, Blue Silver Colour uh, at the Court of Justice, uh, actually the General Court in March this year. We're waiting for the decision on that one. Uh, we've just applied to intervene in another case relating to Adidas Three Stripes uh, and we are considering another case right now. What I, what I do, uh, the purpose of my little spiel now is simply to put out a plea. Could you please uh, stay alive to the fact that uh, we do this? Uh, and if you wish help in some of your cases on their way to the uh, CJEU or the General Court, uh, do please contact us, the Amicus Curiae Committee, and we will consider your case and possibly support you. Uh, but equally might come out against you. So, um, but do, do, do ask us, uh, and uh, we, we love to lend our support where we think it is in, in, in the interests of brand owners. Okay? So, um, uh, as I say, from that point on, I hand over to Sir Robin Jacob, who's your chair tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Roland, uh, and thank Marks for uh, the invention, who invented this um, annual event. You will know who all our judges are, I hope, but just to remind you, in case you have forgotten or you didn't read anything, Sir John Mummery from the Court of Appeal, he's got pensioned off like I have. Um, and then Amanda Michaels, in my opinion, one of the best trademark lawyers in the country. <laughs> cost me a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Camille Lignier from the First Instance Court of Paris a specialist court in IP, uh, and David Keeling, who for many years was in Alicante, and then he moved to Munich and has a huge experience uh, of Board of Appeal work of both sorts. We might even think of a question for him, what's the difference? <laughs> um, I've just thought of it now. <laughs> and for what it's worth, sometimes I jump in as though I was a panellist instead of the chairman. Before we go any further, I want to make an announcement about a thing that you may not have spotted. We have a big lecture in trademarks by Professor Robert Burrell on trademarks and psychology. And that's going to be on the 30th of November. It's the current Legal Problems Lecture, which means it's, it's, he's worked a hell of a lot at it. And uh, since psychology is the in thing, it wins Nobel Prizes for pointing out that people aren't rational. Um, and are nudged by various things they're not even noticing. This could be a really good lecture. It's free. Right, now to our questions. And our first question is this. European case law tells us that the more famous a trademark is, the more likely a variant of that mark will be confused with it and therefore infringe. Some might say the precise opposite. The better you know a trademark, the more you're likely to spot the difference. Is this a case of the law being divorced from reality? Who would like to start on that? Camille? Mm. Or should we have somebody else first? Maybe. Maybe, okay. She's one, she needs to see the bowling yeah. first. Amanda? Well, I have some difficulty with the concept. I must say, I always have done. It seems to me if you've got a particularly well-known mark, people are likely to recognise when it is that mark and are likely to recognise when it isn't that mark. Um, and like all trademark questions, it's a question of fact and degree as to whether, that, whether it, it falls on the side of being, well, obviously not that mark, um, even allowing for imperfect recollection, um, or whether it's, uh, uh, it is something that's close enough to cause confusion. Um, and I, I just 
I don't know whether lay, laying down a, a sort of uh, guideline of that kind necessarily adds uh, helpfully to the task one has to carry out, which is deciding whether, in fact, there's a likelihood of confusion. David? Yep. Uh, it's not... I mean, there are two sides to this. On the one hand, the, the question talks about um, a more famous mark or a more distinctive mark getting, um, being more likely to be confused and therefore getting a broader scope of protection. Of course, on the other hand, the, 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 the opposite, the reverse side of the coin, if you like, uh, a weaker mark should get a correspondingly narrower scope of protection. It seems to me what it's all about is giving... Uh, trademarks the scope of protection that they deserve and not giving them more than they deserve and while I'm not so sure that we need to actually worry about strong marks because I think they can look after themselves really I'm more bothered about uh, giving too much protection to weak marks in particular uh, very descriptive marks and the important point to bear in mind is I think that when you're dealing with a typical opposition or infringement case where theoretically it's all about assessing likelihood of confusion and asking yourself whether a typical consumer of the relevant goods is going to be confused um, because of the similarities of the marks and similarities, similarity of the goods and all that. Uh, the issue is not simply whether there is a likelihood of confusion. The issue is actually whether there is a likelihood of confusion which the owner of the earlier right is entitled entitled to complain about. Uh, that's what it's all about, I think. And maybe if we're talking about a strong mark, a highly distinctive mark, a mark with a lot of inherent distinctiveness or acquired distinctiveness, then maybe there's a stronger case for saying that the owner of that right is entitled to be complaining about whatever confusion there is and possibly entitled even to be saying there's confusion when, as a matter of fact, there possibly isn't. Uh, and correspondingly, I think it's very important to remember that if we've got two people using very weak marks, which both allude to the goods, it's quite possible that consumers are going to be confused, but nobody should be complaining about it. That's the way that, that I see it, Robin. Well, I'll just add my own comment for, again. You remember, we, our own House of Lords have said the precise same sort of comment. They've said, with... with effectively weak marks, office cleaning surfaces against mm. office cleaning association, mm. uh, where there was no passing off as held, they said with weak marks, in effect, there is less room for confusion. And therefore, a small difference is enough to make a difference. I think it's the precise opposite there, mm. written the other way round. It's a legal fiction, I think, Robin. We, we, we've got, we've They're both legal fictions. To, to They're both legal fictions for policy. <laughs> I mean, mm, I, I agree with you. I think that I we're all agreed about this one, John. You've got to go out it. Well, I just say mm. one thing in answer to this question: uh, trademark cases are so fact sensitive that I think a generalisation of this kind, either way, is unhelpful. It wouldn't help you to decide the case. That's not true. You would look at the facts before you on the particular case. Right. Can I, can I yeah. just say something else which uh, it, it raises the question of how in any particular case you prove a likelihood of confusion? How, how do you do that, particularly in a UK court? Do you just hand up the two specifications and, and look at them? Or perhaps if you were looking at them in the, looking at the marketplace because you're actually looking at infringement rather than um, issues of registration, uh, how, you, how do you go about proving that there is a likelihood of confusion. John rightly says it's very fact sensitive, but what facts are there going to be before the court? You can't have a survey showing proving confusion in the UK, and I sometimes wonder exactly what you can have. What about the position in France of proving confusion? Mm, in France, we, we take in account uh, all, the th uh, all, all the contexts in the market. We have um, uh, an exam in concreto. And uh, we, we, we have a very global anal analysis. Uh, so it's case by, uh, by case. Do you have survey evidence? Survey evidence we need just for uh, the reputation of the uh, trademark, 
but not for the risk of confusion. We, we, we don't uh, say that it's necessary if there is in the file, it's, uh, it, 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 it's uh, good, but uh, uh, we, 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 don't, uh, we, we don't use the surveys Has anybody the tried? likelihood. Has anybody tried to prove confusion with a survey before your call? Uh, I don't remember, no, it's, it's really, no, no. Uh, it's really for um, the proof of the um, reputation of the well-known mar uh, trademark. But, but they could, presumably, if they wanted to, and they thought they, they could they do could, they could. They could, of course. Mm -hmm. It's proving a fact, though. So. Right, we've probably done that one to death. <coughs> Next one's got... It's really predicated on the basis that trademark law is rather complicated. Um, Camille is from France, where judges are appointed very young. You see all these kids looking like teenagers in Bordeaux. <laughs> and they're a little more, but not much. Uh, should the UK um, go that way and have a, a system of appointing judges much earlier, at a much younger age, and allowing them to special, specialise more, at least for trademarks? John? I'm not in favour of young judges. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you always had such difficulty with me in the well, court. For a variety of reasons. <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Go on then. Um, uh, they tend to write excessively long and complicated judgments <laughs> because they're starting from scratch rather than starting, as older judges do, from, uh, in my case, 24 years' experience of arguing cases probably similar in Robbins, uh, you don't have to start explaining everything um, because um, you, you quite instinctively have a reliable reaction in many cases to what the answer is. And uh, I can prove my point by looking at American judgments, which are largely written not by judges, but by judges' clerks who are recently recruited from the top law schools. And uh, they write judgments such as it takes two parties to make a contract. <laughs> well, I don't think many judges in England of uh, Robin's age or mine would think it was necessary actually to say that. Um, it's a sort of indisputable proposition that you can't have a contract with yourself. You've got to have at least one other person. So uh, I think young judges are a bit of a pest, I found. They, um, <laughs> they create work for themselves. They create work for other people. Uh, and... My final point would be, it's not I'm not knocking them as individuals, it isn't really fair on them. Uh, it'd be far better to spend their active years arguing cases and trying to persuade judges to conclusions than sitting there having to listen to uh, other people do it. And uh, I think one American judge summed it up, who said that... Um, he would rather speak to a bunch of fools than listen uh, to a bunch of fools. <laughs> <laughs> you're on your feet uh, as, a, as a lawyer, an advocate. As a judge, you are sitting there silent. Not many people in this world are used to sitting for four and a five hours a day, not saying very much. But that's the life of a judge. And a judge who doesn't sit there quietly is probably not doing his job properly. So uh, I think it's not fair on young people for them to be judges, they, they will lose an opportunity to do something like um, advocacy, which is great fun, it's the magic part of the law, uh, and I think if they go there young, they'll just create a lot of unnecessary work for older people. <laughs> I have to say, I'm just going to tell you a story now. John and I were against each other in a case in about 1972, and we had a frightfully lazy judge called well, Foster. Dates us, yes. Yeah. <laughs> frightfully lazy judge called Foster. Mm. And it, at the end of the day, he said, um, well, we hadn't finished, he said, could, could I see counsel in my room? We had looked at each other, had no idea what was going to go on. He said, there's a train strike tomorrow, could we adjourn till Monday? <laughs> 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 and I think he was hoping we were going to make us settle it. Now, Camille, you have no choice in France but no. to be a young judge. But uh, what do you think about it if you had a choice? Uh, I'm not a baby uh, judge anymore. <laughs> I am in the middle of my career, but when I started, I was 23. 
so just after my master in law, uh, because in France we have a national school um, of judges created after the World War Two, and uh, you you at attend this school just after passing a national exam, and after your master in law. Uh, so um, you you have uh, two years training, academic and uh, uh, practical, and the teachers are all judges. We do some mock trials and in different fields: uh, civil, criminal law, commercial law, labor law. And uh, this school is located in the south of France, in the beautiful uh, city of Bordeaux. So the good thing is that you can improve your wine tasting too. <laughs> and uh, in our career, we are not uh, spe uh, specialized. Um, we are educated to be a judge in all fields. Uh, we have to move uh, during our career uh, to be in charge uh, of different uh, matters. For example, I have worked uh, as a judge in uh, different uh, uh, courts and I was in charge of uh, different matters as, uh, such as uh, contracts and liability, uh, enforcement law, labor law, criminal law, uh, so uh, uh, bankruptcy uh, law. And so my professional background um, for me is really helpful uh, when I have to rule a trademark uh, case because uh, you need all this uh, experience. So for me it's uh, a good point, but uh, maybe because I don't know the uh, experience. Mm, um, well, so um, I, 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 can, I can say that uh, it's, it's really good to have all this uh, background uh, than you, uh, when you work uh, in uh, trademarks. Uh, uh, for example, I just started in IP uh, four years ago. So it's it's and you new do for me. Too. I have I have to to spend my summer with all the books and <laughs> and I had a very good uh, uh, teacher because my president uh, is passionate to uh, with uh, about IP. But I had to learn uh, case by case and. But I think that uh, I'm not uh, a bad judge. <laughs> 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 we are free in the panel. <laughs> David, do you have a view on this? Just very briefly, on, on the subject of specialisation, um, I'm not sure about whether I have views on the age of judges and what the ideal age is, but I, I'm, I'm sceptical about specialisation, especially in, in the field of trademark law. I, I just, just speaking from my own experience, I think it's a, it's a subject you either have a feel for or you don't. And I've worked with one or two people, I'm thinking of my Alicante days, I was there for 10 years altogether, I've worked with one or two people who, who were doing trademark cases for years and it seemed to me that they, they still didn't acquire a feel for it. And I think the same can be said for quite a few of the people in Luxembourg at the, at the General Court and the, the Court of Justice itself. On the other hand, I've worked with one or two young people who've come in, people who've straight out of university have come in as assistants, uh, and I found they've, they've picked it up instantly. They, they just had a feel for it. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what you need to, to be a, a, a trademark lawyer. You, you, you've got to... A bit of experience of life is useful, which tends to suggest that uh, older people might be good at it, but also I just, it ought to be about common sense, really. Uh, people ought to do a bit of shopping before they ever... Uh, allowed to, to work on a trademark case and again and I think some of the people in Luxembourg have never been shopping <laughs> <laughs> one of the big problems we have um, so for this reason I, I'm skeptical about specialization you, you need a certain type of person doing trademark cases but um, whether you need whether specialization is a good thing or not I don't know there's also the other problem that I don't know people just get into bad habits in trademark cases I, I, I got so tired of uh, reading judgments on Luxembourg or stuff produced um, in Alicante, uh, where opposition cases where they just go through the motions of comparing the marks and counting the letters and all that and writing a bit of stuff about uh, visual, phonetic, uh, conceptual comparison uh, and so on. Just the, the whole mechanics of it. Uh, it, it seems to me people... Um, people somehow... I, I, either you, you have a feel for it, you, you, you know what it's about, you, you, you care about it, you, you, you actually think about what's happening in the marketplace or you don't. And 
uh, specialization, there is a danger that it's just going to create the wrong type of, of specialist people who are just going to churn out the uh, the mechanical stuff, the tedious um, counting of. Did uh, you find it? Did you find it um, uh, uh, very different when you moved from Alicante to Munich? Uh, yes, very, very different. Uh, in, in, in the totally different jobs. I think you're the way. only person who's done that so far. The Ellen except Greg now, Lange except now the new president is well. doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they're different jobs, and the, uh, the Munich setup. Uh, I mean, I was working there with a lot of technically qualified people, people who had long experience of, of, um, in examination, uh, great experts in their technical fields, and also very knowledgeable about the law. I found myself often, often wondering what I was there for. It seemed to me I was supposed to be a legally qualified member. I was there to give them a bit of advice on legal matters, but the technical people I was working with seemed to know everything there was to know about uh, patent law. Um, the, one of the great differences in, in Munich is that the members there are appointed basically on, 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 for, on, on the basis of competence and experience. So there are no nationality quotas, which has the downside possibly that Germany is overrepresented. I, 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 I don't think there's anything controversial about saying that. Um, in Alicante, again, there's been a bit more of a, a tendency to say, oh, we don't have anybody from that part of Europe, we better appoint you know, a Scandinavian or an East European or something like that. Uh, in Luxembourg, I think this is one of the big problems with the Court of Justice, we have this awful business of one judge per member state in the General Court and in the you know, Court of Justice. And that, of course, that guarantees one thing. You're not having recruitment on the basis of merit. You're getting uh, recruitment on the basis of national quotas. And a, a very strange sort of quota it is, one per member state, regardless of the size of the member state. And in some of these countries, of course, you're fishing in a very small pool. Uh, there's very low population, and you know, there's not a great likelihood you're going no. to get really well-qualified people from some of the smaller so. member states. Uh, so that... Um, that is one of the, one of the okay. big factors. But I think, on the whole, the Boards of Appeal in Munich did a slightly better, certainly do a better job than the court in Luxembourg, uh, certainly more technically competent, and I think on possibly a better job than the Boards of Appeal in Alicante, although I'm not totally convinced about that. Right. Let's have, have you, did I ask you this question? Or oh, John had something else to say. You had something to add up to it. Well, I've got one further point, which um, is a personal anecdote about how uh, specialisation can work. Uh, I entirely agree with being sceptical about specialisation. Uh, to be realistic, of course, uh, uh, nobody can know everything, so specialisation is to some degree inevitable. But I had a comic situation where I was mistaken about my specialities, and um, I was instructed by a city firm, this is about 40 years ago, uh, I think they instructed me in a landlord and tenant case on the uh, understanding that I was Christopher Lockhart Mummery, <laughs> who, who is the editor of a book called Hill and Redman on the law of landlord and tenant. <laughs> um, but uh, as the first case of that kind they did for them was about repossession of their own offices, <laughs> and I succeeded. I could never do anything wrong in their eyes in landlord and tenant cases. And they came one day for a conference, which was very short because the answer was obvious. And at the end, the partner, I think we didn't want to go back to the office, he just wanted to go home, uh, had a chat. And then he said, he said, I'm interested to know, Mr. Murray, what relation you are to the council who does our trademark cases. <laughs> and I said, well, that's me. And, uh, he said, how can you do landlord and tenant and trademarks? Well, I said, I don't know how, but I do. Uh, and so it, it's, uh, there's nothing to stop you being specialised, as I was, in a variety of subjects. You don't pretend to know everything, and if you were sent a case about um, uh, something well beyond your competence, the only responsible thing to do is to say, well, I've never looked at this before. But it's quite possible in the whole area of the law of property, and trademarks is just a part of the law of property, I, that if you're familiar with property principles, whether it's land, patents, trademarks, copyright, uh, uh, incorporeal rights to fish or graze cattle or whatever it is. I used to do all those sort of cases. Um, property principles are very similar uh, throughout the whole of that area of law. So um, I think uh, that this, that what happened to me increases my scepticism about speciality. It's perfectly possible to be competent 
in more than one area of speciality. And if you have any sense, you build up a whole bundle of specialities. It stops you getting bored and it keeps you in touch. As you explained, doing other areas of law keeps you in touch with general principles. You don't just get imprisoned in some little self-contained world um, in which uh, you think everything is answered by the trademarks directive or the trademark regulation or whatever it is. The answer often isn't there. It's in some more general principle of law. I have a question yes, about the UK uh, system. I don't know a lot about uh, your legal system. Um, <coughs> do you deal also with um, unfair competition when you are oh, yes. you have uh, so? Okay, in the same case, uh, yes. you can deal with um, unfair competition and okay. So yes, if you do trademarks so here, mm. you would. You, Robin has given lectures mm. about competition. You're expected to understand not just the law of unfair mm. competition, but the principles of competition law. Generally, because the trademark law comes mm -hmm. in to the law of competition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and abuse of dominant positions and yep. all sorts of mm -hmm. EU concepts. You uh -huh. can't just sort of have this little box that has trademarks on it well, and uh, never go outside uh, it. And I was going to say, and far more basic principles. I mean, yes. You mentioned contract. I mean, a lot of the cases are A lot of cases that we deal with actually involve principles of contract or, or the transmission mm -hmm. of property. Mm -hmm. And if people are too specialised, they don't see the pitfalls yeah. in those respects, right. which are often the absolute nub of the matter. Right, next question. We've only got the number three. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> the, a recent <coughs> EU reform, I don't like the word reform, it sometimes it just means change. Reform suggests change for the better, which is not necessarily true. And that's what the question is about. This was limiting the own name defence in trademarks to to natural persons and not including companies. Was that a good thing, Amanda? Well, um, I don't think so, actually, uh, because I think that the, the uh, own name defence was always hedged around with all kinds of provisions about the fairness of the use that was being made of, of the name. Um, and that seemed to me to give adequate protection, so that if you had a case where as I know Robin did, for example, where a, a, a company name had just been adopted and was causing difficulty, it would be perfectly logical to think that there should be no application of an own name defence. But if you had a long-established company uh, and for some reason uh, perhaps uh, two the parties' businesses had uh, converged or there'd been some change in the way business was being done, or somebody decided to get stroppy when they hadn't been stroppy for many years, um, uh, in those circumstances, perhaps an own name defence might be appropriate, even for a company. So I didn't, didn't see the, the need for that change, and I think there are circumstances in which uh, one could very fairly raise an own name defence in relation to um, somebody other than a natural person. <coughs> Camille. Yes, I have the same opinion. I think that it's unfair for a uh, very well-known uh, commercial name um, because um, they, it's, it's really unfair if they have to change their name uh, because uh, one trademark has been uh, uh, registered. So um, my opinion is uh, it's the same. One. David, did yeah, you write I, a passage in Curly about this? Um, <laughs> I don't think I wrote that passage. Well, what would you have written if it was your bit? Good question. I've actually <laughs> learned something. I, uh, this is one of those rare uh, moments when one changes one mi one's mind after hearing an argument from other people. That doesn't happen very often, does it? I mean, you know, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, we were talking a little bit about this uh, before, and I, I, I initially thought, well, yes, this is quite a sensible reform, uh, taking the view that um, one is born with a name, at least one, one inherits one's surname, and given names are given not by oneself but normally by one's parents uh, and so it's obviously reasonable that one should be allowed to abuse one's name in business not necessarily as part of a trademark uh, and obviously having due regard to fairness honest uh, commercial practices etc whereas a company name a corporate name that's something that you can adopt and obviously the scope for, for bad faith if you just go along and uh, adopt a name uh, but as Amanda pointed out, there are situations in which a company has been around a long time with its corporate name, it's been doing something that's perfectly legal. Uh, they should have certain rights there, certain acquired rights. It reminds me a little 
bit of a way about the, the Arsenal case, if I can say so, where we had uh, Mr. Matthew Reed selling his merchandise outside Highbury Stadium in, in, in the old days. He'd been doing it for years. Then Arsenal come along and register Arsenal as a trademark, and suddenly what Matthew Reed is doing is illegal. I think you can get a similar sort of situation, I think, with, uh, if you've got an old established name and you're using it, and then suddenly somebody registers a trademark and there's a conflict, and you stop from using your name because you haven't actually registered your name as a trademark. Uh, so, yes, I can see there are situations in which companies should be allowed to run so, some sort of a, a, an own name uh, defence. Yeah, I mean, the Park and Old was the big one. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, they, they were a foreign company coming to this country, and they'd had this name for some time, Knoll International. They were the defendants. Uh, and indeed, in due course, they came into this country by, by trade using their own name, bona fide. Mm. Bona fide, that's an important qualification. That, that's, I mean, the qualification really was the bona fide. Yeah. It's now called the honest practices, but same yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, done that one. Very good. Slots. The United States case about mm. a, a, a band of... Chinese Americans, I think they were Chinese, they may have been Japanese, who called themselves the Slants. And they wanted to register the trademark. And they said, oh no, no, this is racially offensive. Uh, you can't have racially offensive trademarks. Go to the Supreme Court, they say, freedom of speech, you can. You can have a trademark as, as offensive as you jolly well like. Um, do you agree, John? No, I'm going to pass on this. <laughs> and I, didn't, I didn't understand. I didn't even know what slants meant. So, uh, <laughs> I'm going to give it to somebody who understands right. why it's offensive. Um, well, I understand that... Hmm? I've read the case, and my understanding of it is that this turns really on the um, American protection of the Constitution and the constitutional right um, to free speech, which can't be trumped by um, the provisions of the Langham Act, I think it is, um, which was the provision relied on by the registrar not to register that as a trademark. Um, so it, it's a sort of constitutional law point rather than a trademark <coughs> point. Um, in terms of whether one should be able to register a truly offensive trademark, my gut reaction is to think, well, why should you be able to register it if it's going to cause offence? Um, not being able to register it is not going to stop you using it. So it's not depriving you of your right of property, perhaps. I don't know. What about offensive marks in France? So on my point of view, forbidding um, the use of a sign as a trademark on the grounds of public policy or uh, morality is not against the freedom of speech. Uh, principle regarding to the uh, European Convention of Human Rights Article 10 because you, you can still use the sign uh, in the public but just not as a trademark. You can use it as a trademark. You, but and this not is against the law. Not registered. Not, register. not, register. not, register, not registered. Mm -hmm. So for me it's not a limit to the freedom of speech. I, I, I would like to share with you Two example um, in the in, in, in the French uh, law, a recent example, um, the the French uh, National uh, Trademark Office decided to refuse the registration uh, of a sign as a trademark on public policy and morality. Uh, it was just after the um, terrorist uh, attacks in uh, 2015 in Paris. Uh, first against the newspaper uh, Charlie Hebdo. And uh, there was a slogan to express a solidarity with the victims, with all the terrorist uh, attacks victims. Um, I am Charlie, Charlie was the name of the newspaper, or I am Paris. And someone tried to register this slogan just a few days after the um, uh, Islamist uh, attacks. Uh, as a trademark. And uh, the office, it's really rare, huh? the national office uh, decided to refuse the, this uh, registration on the grounds of public policy and morality and decided to publish the decision in the media 
it was the first time, saying that these trademarks are terms which cannot be monopolized by an economic player due to their use and public perception in light of the uh, terrorist attacks events. So for me, it's a good example. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, um, decision uh, grant uh, on uh, public policy is not against uh, freedom, uh, the principle of uh, freedom of speech. Th this is my position. Mm. Well, one thing to add, there's just one thing I would say. I don't know if anybody else has read it, but I've read it, and that is, that is President Trump is attempting to register as a trademark the expression, make America great again. <laughs> but I think he's run into trouble because that was the same as the used by Re President Reagan many years ago. <laughs> and whether it was registered as a trademark in, in the US, I have no idea. But, um, yes, and then there was I don't know if that would count as something offensive or not. <laughs> And of course, there was a rule at one point in English law under the old trademark that, that if you mended your trademark deceptive by whatever you did, you lost your trademark. And since he's not doing it... <laughs> <laughs> David, you want anything on offensive trademarks? you have any good ones down in Alicante? There have been one or two. Um, um, I was the rapporteur in the Screw You case uh, that was decided by the, the Grand Board years ago. It's uh, one of the few cases where what I wrote actually got uh, taken on board by the uh, General Court uh, later on. It, well, that decision wasn't appealed, but the later one, Ico Puta, was appealed, and uh, the law was basically the same. Normally, the people in Luxembourg ignore everything I ever wrote, but uh, this is a <laughs> rare exception. Uh, we refused to screw you for clothing in particular and one or two <coughs> other products because we didn't think that somebody should be able to put screw you on a t-shirt and walk down the street uh, and say, oh, this is a registered trademark. Um, we did allow it for one or two uh, curious products which were likely only to be sold in sex shops, uh, the argument being that uh, people who, who frequent such establishments couldn't be offended by, by the word screw. <laughs> The, um, I did form of this, this is the problem with young judges. <laughs> <laughs> I was very young at the time. This is a long time ago. Very good, yeah. But I, I, I did form. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I basically, I think one should be broad-minded about these issues. Yes. <laughs> but I, I did come Why? to the conclusion, thinking about it quite a lot, there are some situations where a trademark office ought to be able to say, no, we're not having that on our register. Mm -hmm. Basically, three types of situations. Trademarks with obscene material. Uh, trademarks with racist uh, insults, racist uh, caricatures. Uh, people of my age uh, maybe remember the Robinson's Jam uh, trademark, um, which uh, was got rid of long ago. Uh, classic example, I think. There's also the issue of blasphemy. Um, I don't know if somebody came along wanting to register a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad or something. Well, uh, I don't want to be the next Salman Rushdie, thank you very much, so I would be refusing <laughs> that one. Um, it's all a bit irrelevant in a way, because you put something on a register, it doesn't mean to say that they can use it. Uh, you're still subject to the general laws on obscenity, on racial hatred, and on um, blasphemy, if there are laws on blasphemy. And conversely, if you, you, the register, if the trademark office refuses to register something, that doesn't mean to say they can't use it. Perhaps that man who wanted to register Screw You, for all I know, is, is making and selling his T-shirts with Screw You emblazoned on the front of them, and um, the fact that he's not got a trademark registration doesn't make any difference. But we took the view that... You, Certain things are offensive, and maybe we, we in a trademark office, I, know, well, I was then in a trademark office, uh, we can't be moral arbiters, we can't tell people what they can and can't use, but we can say, look, you're not having trademark protection for this. Uh, I think that's uh, basically my position on it. So your story being, of, of being in, in effect approved by the Court of Appeal reminds me of Mr Justice Clawson. His clerk came in one day and said, Sir? The Court of Appeal have just upheld you. What case was that? And the clerk tells him, he says, hmm, still think I was right. <laughs> <laughs> that 
<laughs> right, we've, I think we've done that one to death too. Uh, right, um, I think I might skip the one we provisionally marked for number five. Um, so we'll go to six. Which judge has most influenced or inspired you and why? And for this purpose, obviously you have to put out, out of mind the two judges who have most influenced and inspired you, to wit, John and me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, David, who is the, of any, in any field of law? Uh, well, you, you, you've, you've spoiled it for me, really, because I, I was going to say you, Robin, I honestly was. <laughs> if I can't say you, I, I have to say uh, my, myself. <laughs> very good, all right. I had a very hard time in Alicante, by the way, a very frustrating time. Ten years there, uh, writing all these wonderful decisions. I've got a collection of them, I've got them in, in two, two folders. Completely coherent system of trademark law. Nobody ever took any notice of anything I said. Uh, my colleagues in Alicante took very little notice. The people in Luxembourg took even less notice. Um, quite frustrating, but I still think I was right on a lot of things. So that's my answer, me. Right, who's your top judge, Camille? Mm -hmm. yeah, me, I need some uh, judge older because when you start in France, you are really young, so you need some senior judges. And uh, when, uh, when I came uh, in the Paris court specialized in IP, I, I need someone who explain everything about uh, this uh, weird uh, field. And uh, my president, uh, Marie Courboulet, explained me very well that we all the legal rules, but also the fact that we have to uh, take in account when we deal with a case, uh, the Im economical impact and the impact on the market. And for me, it was um, it was new because um, um, in in France we we don't speak a lot with uh, with companies lawyer of, uh, uh, with uh, because um, you 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 have to be neutral to be uh, independent. And I, I realized that in fact you can stay neutral, you can stay independent. Uh, but still have a, a really interesting debate with uh, uh, people from other uh, fields and uh, some uh, barristers, uh, uh, companies, lawyer, and um, to, to like this event. It's, it's really interesting to, to, to um, also meet uh, other uh, judges from all of the uh, countries. Especially in uh, Europe, and she 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 learned me every, uh, all the, these things, and I think that uh, I, I learned a lot. So, so it's Marie Cobolli. Yes, yeah, Marie Cobolli. John, who's your top judge? Well, I haven't got any doubt about this uh, <laughs> uh, influence. We we just had a little game. I've got my view. He's got his view, and we didn't swap it in advance. So I don't know who he's going to say. It. Well, on both influence and inspiration, I have no doubt. Um, and the greatest influence on me, both as an advocate and as a judge, was Lord Bingham. Um, uh, Lord Bingham led me when I was a barrister. I, he led me in a big copyright um, uh, uh, merchandise. Well, it, it's difficult to say what sort of case it was altogether, but a case about James Bond that lasted 25 years. <laughs> 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 and we were for the um, people who made the James Bond films and the. Um, those who inherited uh, through his family the rights to authorize the making of them. And he led me in other cases. And uh, he was such a brilliant advocate that uh, I only had to do one case with him to completely change the style in which I argued cases. Um, he, I saw him completely trounce his opponents uh, by uh, being concise and clear and advancing cases <coughs> arguments that were incontrovertible. Uh, but the people just didn't have an answer to them. I and mean, he would think out a case in advance so well. 
that uh, he would win by a series of propositions that were incapable of contradiction. Uh, when he went on the bench, uh, I appeared before him, and when I went on the bench, I sat with him, and when I went to the Court of Appeal, I was both overruled and upheld by him. <laughs> and his great qualities, I always thought, were the qualities of a perfect judge. Uh, he was endlessly courteous, uh, if he disagreed with you, uh, instead of saying, as some people do, uh, I think you're talking nonsense, <laughs> or even worse, um, he would say, I don't think we're thinking along quite the same lines. <laughs> um, so it was a pleasure to be disagreed with, really, because it was all polite. And he had a technique as a judge, which I used um, almost every case, it, when the 17 years I was in the Court of Appeal, he, what I call the replay method. Uh, he would listen patiently to what people said, and then he would sum up to them what they had said, far clearer and more, more um, persuasive than they had, and says, is that your case? And they either said yes, in which case he said, thank you very much, right, and then go and hear the opposite case. If they said no, they were in deep trouble <laughs> because they had to say, well, in what way isn't it your case? And often they couldn't explain. And now, that, that method of judging is, to my view, by far the best way of judging anything because the judge is not only getting clear to himself what the rival cases are, he is demonstrating to the parties in contention that he understands their case I would say probably even better than they do. And so it is a most perfect method of judging. It's not easy, but he was, uh, and as a, as a person outside court, he was charming, he was witty, um, and uh, in my view, he's probably, uh, even though I appeared before Lord Denning and I, I knew him and so on, he was a great figure, I think that Lord Bingham is probably the greatest judge that this country has ever produced. His judgments on wide ranges of topics are are classics, and uh, in his um, retirement, which was unfortunately brief, he died within a short time of retiring, but he lived long enough after his retirement to write the book The Rule of Law, which is probably a hugely influential, hmm, must be the most influential book of law. It's in a paperback, it's, it isn't very long, uh, but it is very wise and has already had, I mean, I've had um, people at school asking if they can come to court. Uh, and um, I say, well, why are you interested in law? And they said, I've read Lord Bingham's Rule of Law. They've got interested in it. He's, in, he's written a book that school children can read and get interested about. So that's my answer, Lord Bingham. Well, I can't top that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say, um, on, on just on the point of courtesy, I remember having a hearing in front of uh, Mr. Justice Gray, Charles Gray, years and years ago, and it was a really nasty, nasty case. Everybody hated everybody else. It was really contentious. <laughs> not not counsel. Typical but, case. But, <laughs> but the parties were at each other's throats, and he dealt with everybody in the most yeah. delightful manner. And I remember my clients coming out of court and saying, well, at least I know I've had a fair hearing, and I've... I've carried that with me since, and I really hope that people come out of a hearing where I preside saying the same thing. And if I if I if they don't, then I'm ashamed of myself because it, that seemed to me. I'm um, obviously uh, John's points about the way Lord Bingham dealt with things are fantastic, but but I thought that was a pretty basic thing for a judge. Well, I think Amanda and I say the same thing. It's not what the judge decides that is influential on other judges, it's the way he goes about it. We're not talking about great great rulings, controversial rulings or uh, precedents, we're talking about behaviour, hmm? yes, you also say, mm. behaviour mm. in court as a judge in the dispensing of justice. And it's no, getting, get, no good in my view giving correct rulings if uh, you don't give the impression, at least, of having reached your decision in a fair and just manner. I'll add to that just a bit. When I was a young barrister, we had a judge called Pat Graham, and he was quite good early on, but before he used to go to sleep in the afternoons as he got older. But, <laughs> but in the early, he was very good. And I, and I won a case for a client. He held that they infringed the patent, or the other side infringed his patent. 
was for an air a dryer that goes over a bath. And then somebody else came up with another variant, and we argued it, and, 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 and we lost. Well, I said, you know, there's a bit of room for manoeuvre here. We could have a go in the Court of Appeal. The client said, no, he said, I'll take the opinion of that bloke. Mm. That yes. is 51% customer satisfaction, which is about yeah. as good as you can get as a judge. Yeah. My top judge of all time is probably Tom Bingham. Not Tom Bingham, Lord Atkin. I work with Tom. I appear before Tom. Yeah. I remember Tom telling, the other, t telling Pat Graham that the other side were crooks. How did he do it? He said, this is what they've been doing. It looked pretty shabby. He said, the only possible explanation for that, and then he came up with some fantastic explanation, which, made, which wasn't the dishonesty which he was in fact telling the judge they were. Very difficult, is it? The other side was Pat Neal. And he, had, he, he couldn't come back and say, well, they've accused me of being a crook and that's wicked and so on and so forth, because Thomas said he won't. And uh, he, he was something of a genius. We have his picture in the hall in Gray's Inn, and other judges may come and go, but if we keep him and Atkin in there, we're all right. Right. Next question. We, we know that there are trademark searches that are done by computers these days, looking for comparisons. Um, are we going to one day have computers decide the cases? Or would it be a good idea if you say, well, you know, the computer says these are too close, that's enough. Instead of having all the legal expense of arguing and fighting and whatnot, you just put in the computer and come out with an answer. Would you like that, Camille? <laughs> uh, I've never had the feeling that uh, an artificial uh, intelligence can rule a decision uh, in trademark conflict, even if it's a really simple case. Um, when we think about the, the, the famous triple test, uh, phonetical, uh, um, uh, vis visual, phonetic, and conceptual, a computer can count uh, every word, uh, letters, or uh, syllable, uh, or colors in common between uh, uh, two signs. But uh, because we have to take in account all the context uh, of the market in which the, the trademark uh, are used, and we, we have to uh, take in account the subjective uh, perception of the consumer, only a human being or good judge uh, can do that uh, fortunately for us because uh, we would be uh, we would be uh, unemployed if uh, you can do that by computer what do you think just put it in any canty machine would it be would it be better than what's going on now given the state of, of what your opinion of the state of affairs is in european yes well <laughs> i think it wouldn't be very much different because I think it's already <laughs> happening <laughs> to some extent. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I read the judgments coming out of the general court and I read the stuff that's being produced by my former colleagues in Alicante and uh, I get the impression it has been written by a computer. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't really but what they're doing is mechanical jurisprudence. Uh, they're, they're, they're doing it by, well, copy-paste to start with. And I've said for years that if you want to get any decent uh, case law out of Luxembourg, the first thing you should do is, is get in there and disactivate the copy-paste copy function on all their computers. It would lead to a huge improvement in, in, the, in the quality of the uh, judgments if they actually had to start thinking about what they're writing instead of just clicking and copying whole chunks of uh, 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 so-called reasoning. The problem is it's... It's called a legal formalism, this idea that there is a single correct answer to every legal problem. You just uh, apply the right criteria and the right rules, um, you write a few sentences, standard sentences, and you come up with the answer, and it's the only possible correct answer. It's nonsense in any field of law. It's especially nonsense in the field of trademarks, which, where so much does depend on, on, on feeling. I think you, you're much better off going by your gut reactions than you are by writing all this stuff about the visual, phonetical, uh, conceptual comparison. Actually, in one of my rebellious phases, which I think 
was for about seven of the ten years that I was in Alicante. Uh, I, I, I started writing decisions in opposition cases in which I did not use the words visual, phonetic, or conceptual. And I, I got away with this, actually. Nobody, nobody ever realized I wasn't using them. No, nobody challenged me. Uh, I, I didn't totally ignore the case law. I, I didn't ignore the criteria. I did say you've got to take into account what the trademarks look like and what they're going to sound like if there are word elements that are going to be pronounced and if they have any meaning and all that. But I didn't go through the standard stuff about visual, phonetical, conceptual. Uh, I think it's an awful lot of nonsense. Um, uh, and frankly, I, 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 I don't think it helps very much. I, I don't think we end up with sensible decisions. We were talking about confusion earlier on, but I want to ask a question. Uh, have any of you ever bought the wrong product because you were confused by trademarks? Yeah. Ah, somebody has, yeah. Can, can you tell us the trademarks? It was peanut butter, and I confused Sun Pat. Even though I was Ah, w w was similar word mark or similar get up, similar, similar appearance? Similar word mark, similar get up. Yes. Okay. But ha ha I didn't notice until I got home. So yeah. It but it only happened once. It did only happen once. Yeah. You didn't go on buying it for years. No. <laughs> no. Else, yeah. <laughs> and I think that's the point that one has to bear in mind. Yet occasionally it's going to happen. You're going to buy the wrong product. But uh, you've got things like the lemon juice. <laughs> Well, the GIF case. Yes, yes. The, the we, had, we, we did have, we had, I, I didn't think we'd ever get it, but we had huge quantities, really quite significant quantities of confusion. Yeah. yeah. And it was just, it was the freaky thing, they didn't really look at the label because they were just picking up a plastic lemon. Yeah, yeah. the label came off long before and the, and the expiry date. The best test, the best test we did there was on pancake day. We yes. put out, put out table, put tables with uh, lion's pancake mix as Mardi Gras. Uh, and uh, 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 lion's pancake mix and the enemy's lemons in their boxes with their labels on. And then we had solicitors hiding behind refrigerators. <laughs> <laughs> and they would say, and they were nearly all women, not all of them, excuse me, madam, what have you got in your basket? Don't look. Oh, and they would say, this is this, the jiff lemon. Have a look again. And a lot of them were very angry. There was one chap, he was a man this time, he, and they, they'd all got lemon, they'd all got water inside these lemons. Um, and one chap would say, no, 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 and walked out and bought, insisted on buying his, his wrong one with water in it. <laughs> anyway, that, I mean, it does happen. It's a special case, though, the, the Jif Lemon case. It, it's a very special, it was case. a very special case. Yeah, I, I still think far too many oppositions succeed. Um, yeah, I think 90% yeah. of them should be thrown out. Um, it's, it's just far too easy to succeed with an opposition, and it's, it's actually very damaging. It's becoming very difficult to, to register a trademark nowadays because you're going to be hit by an opposition. Very often there's no real problem. Uh, very often they're not competitors. People are just playing a silly game. Uh, they're filing oppositions for the sake of it. And the well, there are people that there are... Uh, is, it, is it right that there were, there were kind of... Blanco White used to tell me when I... He said in Chambers, he said, Oh, to Germans... Trademark opposition is a national sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and you couldn't really tell whether that was true or not yeah. until Alicante came yeah. when you found out who was conducting oppositions. Yeah. And allowing for the fact that Germany is a much bigger country, still there was a much greater yeah. proportion of opponents who were German than any other nationality. It, it, it is very much a game to them. And uh, the problem with oppositions is it's all decided in a very artificial context as well. In theory, you've got the same criteria being applied in an infringement case. But in an infringement case, you've got a real context. You've got an allegedly infringing product. In an opposition case, you've got a trademark applied for. You've got an earlier sign, normally a registered sign. And very often, neither of them are real trademarks. Or they're just parts of what the real package is, what the real brand identity is. You're, you're comparing two colours or two word elements and very often whatever it is that you're comparing, they're not actually being used in isolation, they're being used in, in a context along with other signs. Uh, it really has 
For me, it really has n not enough to do with reality. It doesn't have enough to do with what's happening in the marketplace. Place. I think oppositions, I, I don't know if, 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 if they really, I do sometimes wonder if they ought to be done away with the, 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 the whole thing. Mind you, I sometimes find myself thinking that trademark registration systems should be done away with as well. So, John? Artificial intelligence. Now, sometimes I think the Court of Appeals is full of artificial intelligence. Well, <laughs> well I, my only point is that I must say I did wish sometimes that some of our work could have been done by a computer. Uh, but the example I will give is one that demonstrates how impossible this idea is that we will ever be able to reach uh, the stage when judicial decisions are taken by artificial intelligence or technology. The example is this. Robin will tell you, one of the most burdensome jobs in the Court of Appeal isn't deciding appeals, it's deciding whether or not to grant permission for an appeal. And you have mm -hmm. to sit there wading through uh, dozens of uh, case papers piled up in big boxes to decide. And the test is, I, the test is whether it's from a trademark judge or a commercial judge or chancery judge about a tax case or something, the test is, uh, has the appeal a reasonable prospect of success? Now, how could a computer or any form of artificial intelligence <coughs> make such an assessment? To me, that shows the kind of human factor, the judgment factor, the perspective factor, the weighing things up, which is an essential part of judicial process, which could never be done in any automated any automated, mechanical way. And that question, I think, shows that beyond doubt. Yeah, I would think granting permission to appeal was one of the hardest things it's to do. really difficult. It, different judges had different views. John and I it's, did it much the same way. If we, 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 We're not going to spend two days looking at this thing. We haven't got time. Life is too short for that. You're not deciding the appeal. You're deciding whether it's a runner. Whether there should be an appeal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so if you can't do it in an hour or so, you're in trouble. And by and large, I used to let it happen. Uh, if, if I saw it was a big case, and then they, they let them have their case. After all, we had the Court of Appeal. People should be on the whole. This has only been done to save money. Um, there's not a very good reason for not hearing the case. But I, I used to sometimes see cases which I thought were absolutely clear, which, where permission to, to appeal had been given by some other Lord Justice. When I first got there, um, I sometimes said to myself, well, that's very odd. Why did they ever give leave to appeal? It turned out to be a plain case. Mm. Later on, I found that there were cases in which I'd given leave to appeal. And I said, why the bloody hell did I give leave to appeal? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 and it, it's, it, it is a very difficult jurisdiction. I, I should just explain that in our system, you can't appeal in a civil case without permission, except in the special case of contempt of court. And habeas corpus. And habeas corpus. <laughs> if someone's been locked up without <laughs> lawful authority, uh, someone, uh, you don't need permission to appeal. It's such a serious thing. But in the ordinary case, the intellectual property case, uh, and every other kind of civil case, you cannot appeal to the Court of Appeal or from there to the Supreme Court without a court's permission. And so this process, it's now got to the stage, I can tell you, in the Court of Appeal where more judicial time is spent on deciding whether there should be an appeal than is spent on deciding the outcome of the appeal. Mm. Yeah. Because th th in most cases, the loser has got nothing to lose by having a go. So the losers almost automatically say, well, let's try and get leave to appeal. And so one is inundated with, with this sort of work. And I remember, I agree with Robin, I had one conscientious judge next to me, who's now retired, I think, because he was fed up with doing these things. <laughs> he, he said to me, John, I have spent two days on a permission to appeal application. And I said, you have wasted your life. <laughs> and if, if it takes you two days to decide whether or not to allow someone to appeal, you should have allowed them to appeal. If it's taken you two days to decide that, there must be something in it. There must be something that's just taking you that long. I used to say, if it takes me more than an hour, Hmm? to make up my mind, I should grant permission. Because I haven't sorted it out. I, otherwise, one isn't saving judicial time. One is actually wasting judicial time by deciding sort of half the appeal in order to decide whether you'll hear the whole appeal. It's just, 
it, it's a very unsatisfactory situation, and I tell you, it's the bane of life of appeal judges. Now then, in our court, sometimes in appeal courts, we sit in panels of three. First instance, generally just one. And if you're sitting in a panel of three, which is better? The judges sign off on a single judgment, including the judge who doesn't agree with the other two, or the judges write their own judgments, including possibly agreeing, but for different reasons, or which? The UPC, which is not, we're doing trademarks, they, is allowing dissenting opinions expressly, doesn't actually say that assenting opinions are forbidden. What do you think, Camille? You are a prisoner of the system that you, you sit with three? Mm -hmm. Yes, in France, when we are <coughs> in a free panel in churches, uh, court decisions are always uh, ruled by the majority uh, of the judge's opinion. So there is no uh, <coughs> dissenting uh, opinion in France. So the president has to sign the decision even he, if he or she uh, does not agree with the, this decision. I, uh, Sometimes I have to sign a decision and uh, I do not agree with this decision, but it's, it's a rule. And in fact, it's uh, for historical reasons, uh, because judges in France are considered as the mouth of the law since the French Revolution. And there is just <coughs> one way to apply the rule. That's why you just uh, have one decision. And the good thing is that we have to sometimes go to a compromise and when we are not all agree. And uh, uh, I believe that the solution um, is often more wise and uh, it's we avoid um, too radical uh, decisions in this way. John, what do you say? I mean, you sat as a panel of and you've dissented well, I, uh, and agreed and... Uh, my own view is that it's far better to have a system where there is only one judgment. Uh, uh, and it's a perfectly... Uh, and most of my colleagues don't agree with that, or my former colleagues. Uh, they like the, the freedom to disagree. But when you disagree with the majority, you are by definition in our system delivering a judgment which is wrong. <laughs> and what is the point of that? I really don't understand. I must say, I have 17 years in the Court of Appeal. I dissented less than half a dozen times during having heard thousands of cases. I thought it was a complete waste of time. And some people would, would spend huge amounts of effort writing a judgment disagreeing with the majority. And I can see what the point of it was. But uh, I rather changed my mind when late in uh, my career there, uh, and we heard an employment case on which I was supposed to be more knowledgeable than uh, some of the others, and um, it was agreed that I would write the leading judgment. So we heard it, and we agreed at the end that um, I would go away and write a judgment dismissing the appeal. So I wrote it, and uh, I circulated it to the other two, and one said, I don't agree with you. Uh, I said, fine. So he wrote a judgment disagreeing with me. The other one had already agreed with me, but when he read the other judgment, he disagreed with me. <laughs> so uh, from me now writing a leading judgment, I finished up writing the dissenting judgment. And uh, I didn't mind. I, mean, I, I, I was a favor of people disagreeing, but I thought their judgments were, were wrong. And, uh, but I didn't, I didn't actually disagree with them overtly. I mean, I didn't even... I just said I would, uh, I would uh, dismiss this appeal. They said they would allow it. I didn't criticise their judgments or argue with them. Anyway, it went to the Supreme Court, uh, where I was upheld 5-0. <laughs> so I was then rather in favour of the dissenting <laughs> having, having been upheld by... But that was quite... I never had an experience like that again. Um, 
sometimes the dissenter is right. That's the only time when it ever happened to me. In other cases where I was dissenting, I was not agreed with by a higher court or by the court in, in Luxembourg or wherever it was. So uh, I think dissenters on the whole are either by definition wrong because the majority are deciding what the law is and you're not agreeing with it, or um, it, it, in other cases, it's just as a waste of it's just a waste of time, really. Uh, there may be exceptional cases like the one I've mentioned, where uh, some judges who are not so familiar with the area of law, it could be trademark law, get the wrong end of the stick. This is what happened in this case. They they somehow got the wrong end of the stick. They had failed to recognise that there was a rule in employment law, which was exceptional. It didn't apply in any other part of the law, and they were rather going with what the general principles were and not recognising how powerful an exceptional principle in employment law was and actually dominated this case. It was all about a, a principle for the protection of employees against coercion and threats and intimidation by their employer. So that's an exceptional area where the litigant is protected against the other litigant because of their vulnerable position in, in, the, in the workplace and in, in litigation as well. I think there's a actually a difference between a situation where the court there is a, a, a court above then the dissent may have a purpose mm. which is mm. the, to tell the court above in our system this may be a case for leave to appeal um, because there's been a conflict in the court of appeal and I did that once um, and a dissent in the highest court, which sometimes might be said to be a cry in the wilderness, although there is one exception even to that, and that is Lord Atkins' dissent in Liversidge and Anderson, which came to be accepted as the true position in law. But he was just on his own, wasn't he? He was, on, he was not only on his own, but he was mm -hmm. ostracised, the government went after him, everybody went after him. Amidst the clash of arms, the laws are not silent. It's pure poetry. <laughs> but, but what happens, well, of course, as, from a practical point of view, yeah. if there are dissenting judgments, is that uh, going forward, we as lawyers seek uh, where it suits us to rely on dissenting judgments and say, well, I know the, court, the majority of the Court of Appeal in this case said X, but the dissenting judgment's very strong, it says why, and let's, let's, let's pursue why through the courts, and maybe we can get to the Supreme Court this time. So it has a practical impact on cases that follow afterwards, not looking at the question of, of uh, um, whether it's right or wrong that that should happen, but it, has, it does have an impact. Um, and, and I think maybe sometimes that's a good thing, and maybe sometimes it's not. The answer is well, yes. probably use them sparingly. Well, if you've got some spare time, read a non-trademark case, and that is the Brexit appeal about whether Parliament or not had to be involved in the decision to serve the notice under Article 50. Uh, the, the, the majority said, as, as I thought, probably Robin did as well, that it's Parliament that decides these things because we live in a representative parliamentary democracy. We're ruled uh, uh, in lawmaking by Parliament, not by government. Anyway, but if you read the dissenting judgment of Lord Reed, you'll read a very powerful judgment. It's beautifully written and wonderfully argued, and it's a pleasure to read it, even though you don't agree with it. Um, but um, and and he had he had two allies with him as well. I mean, he was, I think they were two other members of the Supreme Court were persuaded by the force and brilliance of his judgment to agree with him. But they were outnumbered. The full court had sat. So they were out, he was out, he was out <coughs> number. But it, it, when you read it, you realise what a marvellous judgment a dissenting judgment can be. Not the same read yes. as my read. Not Lord Ack. No, 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 not, not, not Lord Reed, who was another great Scottish judge for so many, Robert many years. Reed, yeah. Who's a, going to be a very great judge, in my view. Right, now then. We've got to 22 minutes past, or 20 past. Is it drinking time, or, it, or does everyone want to press on for a bit longer? <laughs> those who want to press on for a bit longer we've got more those who want to go and have a drink hands up those who want to have a drink <laughs> <laughs> and those who, those who want to press on <laughs> no. 
Most of them are asleep. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of abstentions there. There were. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's going to be chairman's casting vote. It's drinky's time. But let's first of all thank the panel and thank Camille especially because she had much further to come. Yeah. <laughs>